Hello. Just set my water down because I am sure I'll need this. Um, you get parched when you're talking, you know? Um, so how many of you uh, think you're dyslexic? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Cool. How many of you have been officially diagnosed with dyslexia? One person, two, yeah, me too. <laughs> so um, only 2% of people have actually, boop, work. <laughs> it's gonna happen, guys, I promise. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> Everyone rush quick. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there is a graph and it says 2%. Um, <laughs> there we go, woo! Should I come up here and, and use this instead? Okay, does it work? Look at that. Okay, so um, back to what I was saying. So yeah, only 2% of people with dyslexia have actually been diagnosed. So that's a pretty small percentage. That means 98% of people out there who are dyslexic have never gone through like the full day of testing to find out if you're dyslexic, which is a pretty astounding number. Um, I am part of that small 2%. Um, this is me. The, the teal is not natural. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so when I was three years old, I was in preschool. And um, we were learning the alphabet at that time. I don't remember this. This is a story my mom shared with me. But we were learning the alphabet. And I could not retain it. I always had to try to sing it to the song. I tried to count it over my fingers. I always skipped the letter N, which was weird. <laughs> and even if I did remember it one day, the next day I came back and I completely forgot what it was, um, which as a three-year-old is pretty defeating, because <laughs> that's like the biggest thing in the world. You're like, can't I learn the alphabet? And no, I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> so eventually my teacher, Miss Diana here, she, um, she sat down my mother and she told her that she believed that I had a learning disability and that I should go and get tested. So my mom did just that. She took me to, we were living in Texas at the time. Uh, she took me to Dallas, Texas. There's a um, hospital there that does like full day of testing to find out what learning disabilities that you have. Um, so you do like a lot of puzzles, you do like an I IQ test, you try to read things. Um, and by the end of it, uh, we found out that I had a pretty high IQ, um, but I had a 20% deficit in my learning ability, or my reading ability, compared to my age group, which is a pretty big number. Um, and that's when I was officially diagnosed with dyslexia. Now, this didn't come as a big surprise to my mom, because she also happened to be dyslexic. And her father also was dyslexic, and I'm sure one of his parents, my great-great-grandparents, uh, was dyslexic as well, because dyslexia can be hereditary, um, along with a very round face and a long nose. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because my mom struggled with dyslexia all through her life, and she obviously knew that her father did too, um, she knew that she, the proper way to like get me past being dyslexic and the struggles that I was going to face as I was growing up was having a really great support system, having really excellent teachers that understood uh, the struggles I was going to go through, and then also encouraging me to explore my creative side, um, which luckily helped me flourish. That's partially why I'm a designer, because the arts was always part of my life. Um, and then I also learned to learn differently, which is really important as a dyslexic. But I definitely, I definitely struggled. So. I was held back in kindergarten, so I took kindergarten twice. Uh, pretty cool badge to have. <laughs> um, I also had to bring a letter to um, every teacher every year to explain that I was dyslexic and that I needed extended time on tests, that I needed every book that we were going to read on tape and ahead of time, and that I needed to go to special ed classes um, to have like a private space to um, read or take additional reading classes. Um, which happened pretty early on, and then eventually it was just a place to go do a test, um, hopefully in silence, but it was never quiet. So it wasn't really a great setup, even though my mom knew the proper things to do for me, it just wasn't perfect. And that's because the education system really isn't set up for dyslexics. And now being older and being a designer, I've noticed that neither is a lot of the stuff out there on the web or any of the applications that we're using. Um, and this is just my story. There's you know, a lot of different ranges in how strong dyslexia is for people. Um, and it's different for everyone. Now, 20% of the population is affected by dyslexia. So that's about one in five people. And just to give you a little example of what it's like to have dyslexia, um, let's try to read this. I'll give you a couple of minutes or seconds. <laughs> I look at this and I get angry. <laughs> it's very frustrating, right? You kind of can figure it out, but you're already forgetting what you just read when you're like, a few words down, right? Um, so this is what it's like in the minds of a dyslexic. 
And uh, that can happen with reading or writing or math as well. It's kind of different for everyone. Um, but this has nothing to do with your IQ or not being smart enough. They actually have no correlation at all. Um, in fact, people like Albert Einstein, he was dyslexic. And he was obviously a very successful theoretical physicist. And he loves sticking his tongue out. So <laughs> I love Albert Einstein. He's been kind of an icon in my life. My dog's also called Einstein. That's how. <laughs> But I kind of looked up to him as I was growing up and knowing that, you know, I'm dyslexic and trying to not allow those thoughts of like, I'm not smart enough, I'm not going to be able to succeed in this, get to me. And he was kind of like that person who I looked up to, uh, even though he's dead, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> um, that I looked up to and I wanted to be able to, you know, be as successful as him. Now, 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic, which is a pretty big number. Um, people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and uh, Steven Spielberg, Cher, Tom Cruise um, are all dyslexic. Uh, also Walt Disney. So obviously there's not a lack of intelligence with being dyslexic and it, it's uh, pretty related to very creative people. Um, so what exactly is dyslexia then? If it has nothing to do with IQ, if it obviously is affecting people's reading and writing and math abilities, what exactly is like happening in your mind? Well, um, our brains function on, our uh, functionality uh, ranges on a spectrum which is called neurodiversity. <laughs> Fancy transition. <laughs> um, so every brain in this room is slightly different in function and form and structure, but that doesn't mean that your brain is any lesser than my brain, or that you, we just all think a little bit differently, right? And especially when it comes to dyslexia. Dyslexics definitely di think a little bit different. Um, so a lot of people associate it with flipping letters, right? So B equals D, and I'm already getting dyslexic, P, Q, 9, who knows? Um, <laughs> along with numbers and along with words. So being dyslexic, you actually still see these the same way as everyone else. Um, but what is actually happening is that your mind as a dyslexic is having trouble manipulating the, the shapes of the actual letters or numbers. Um, and it's having trouble like decoding what they're reading. So our brains is what is like switching and mirroring and rotating the letters. Uh, to give a better example of this, when you take a coffee cup, for instance, um, when you flip it or mirror it or rotate it, it still keeps the same meaning. It's still a cup of coffee. But when you take the letter B, and you switch it or mirror it or rotate it, it suddenly has a whole lot of different meanings, which can be really confusing. So the reason this is happening is because of how our brains think. So our brains are divided into two hemispheres. We have our left hemisphere, which is for language and reading, and then our right hemisphere, which is for um, spatial activities. And what's happening when a dyslexic is reading is that they're relying on the right hemisphere and frontal lobe to, um, to process what they're reading, when in reality it's supposed to be this back, this back section um, where reading and language is processed. So it takes us a little bit longer to um, decipher what we're reading because it has to go here first and then it goes into the back. And that means it takes about three times longer, um, can be up to three times longer, for dyslexics to um, read something. And that can cause a lot of stress and fatigue. So what used to be a struggle reading books, you know, physical books in your hand, has now translated over to struggling while reading digitally. Um, a lot of this has to do with very text-based, long-form writing platforms like uh, Medium, which, you know, all of us designers, I'm sure, are on all the time, <laughs> at least I am, um, and then blogs and news websites and book apps. So anything with a lot of dense text, just like these examples here. So now that we have a better understanding of what dyslexia is and, and how it really is just a different way of thinking, uh, let's explore some simple ways to design better for dyslexia. All right, first things first, let's talk about the letters. <laughs> so typography. So there are some typefaces out there that are specifically made for dyslexics, but recently there was a study done that disproved that they actually worked. So <laughs> great, right? Woohoo! <laughs> Um, so what I recommend is using just simple typefaces, so a sans serif, nothing that has anything fancy or frilly on the edges, um, something that's just very clean and non-distracting, and also using a typeface that has very distinct characters, so the B's and the D's and the P's and the G's and the 9's all kind of look a little bit different, right? Um, also offering alternative typefaces is helpful, 
So if someone's wanting to switch it to something that is more simple and you want to use something fancy, that's fine. But giving the alternative for someone like who has dyslexia um, will benefit them definitely. And also, speaking of like fancy styling, um, trying to avoid using all caps or italics or underlining things or center or right justifying. I know this simplifies a lot of our design decisions. <laughs> Um, but remember, this is a lot for like long-form writing and, and reading. Um, and that's because, again, it's just very distracting. A dyslexic person is already struggling so much to just figure out what the letters they are and the words that they're reading. So adding any more complex structure to the typefaces is going to be difficult for them. Uh, next is the content itself. So, I mean, these are pretty standard things. You know, keeping something clear and concise content-wise is super important for anyone, but especially for dyslexic people, because who likes going to a website that's just like a bunch of text, and you're like, you know what, I'm not even going to read this anymore. Um, I know I do that a lot, because I just don't want to struggle. Um, so keeping the character count and line length to 45 to 100 characters, and also making sure that you're reinforcing your, um, you know, your text and your copy with plenty of visual aids and um, icons or graphs or something you know, visually stimulating like videos um, to help assist with the, uh, you know, the wording. Um, and of course, with that said, don't overwhelm. You don't want to just put everything possible on a page. You want to make sure that you're being uh, very caring and considerate about the content that you're putting on the website or the app. Next is legibility. So instead of using you know, pure black on white, because I, I think a lot of us know that that vibrates on the screen and it can be really hard on anyone's eyes, but again, even more so of a dyslexic. So being really gentle with the contrast, um, enough so that it's compliant, but not too much to where it's just like frustrating to look at. Um, also making sure that you're not... Uh, you're not using images with text in them, uh, because then a text reader can't work on it. And text readers are probably one of the most important things when it comes to dyslexia. Um, if I have the option to use a text reader to read a long format um, article or something, I will use it. But a lot of times, what I've found in my experience is that the code isn't set up properly to use the right div tags, um, so it's not pulling from the right headers. And that can really mess up, mess up a text reader. So making sure that you're using the correct um, accessibility standards and um, div tags and header classes is going to help um, someone using a text reader. All right, outside of typography, <laughs> um, CAPTCHAs. Well, I don't think anyone like CAPTCHAs. I, I raise your hand if you like CAPTCHAs. Woohoo! They're my favorite thing. No. Um, <laughs> so as you can see here, and I don't know if it's just me because I'm dyslexic, but um, that is, I don't even know what that says. Um, so you come in here and you're swe I'm sweating just because I'm on stage, but I'm sweating also when I'm looking at CAPTCHAs. Um, and this is really, really stressful. Um, so instead of using something that has funky text, um, preferably doing something just simple, maybe a checkbox that you're not a robot, or something that's uh, image-based, though that's also very frustrating when it's like right at the corner. You're like, well, do I include that box? I don't know. <laughs> Um, and then next, optimizing your search capabilities. So don't rely on accurate spelling. I know, I go to Google all the time because I'm like, I kind of know how to spell this word. It has a D in it, it has an S. <laughs> and that's all I know. And then luckily, Google is you know, set up to have autocorrect and make uh, the correct suggestions, which is great. That's a dy dyslexic's dream. And when you don't offer those things, oh my god, it's so frustrating. So making sure that you offer the ability to have like the autocorrect in there and that you're pro providing suggestions when someone's searching. Um, pretty, pretty simple stuff, right? <laughs> and then lastly, time limits. So this is a dark pattern anyways, I think. I think when you go and you're like checking out um, for a ticket or something, not naming any names. <laughs> um, it's you get there and you're like, oh my god, I only have four minutes and fifty one seconds to fill this out, and then you misspell everything, right? That's like, of course. Um, and I know I certainly do that, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only dyslexic or human being in this world that has that pressure. So either removing this entirely, or I know, like you know, there might be a business need, or like those things have to be released at some point if it's a like a concert ticket, um, providing the ability to at least extend the time. Um, so someone who's dyslexic or just you know, gets stressed out by those things uh, can have that relief of knowing that they're not going to lose their tickets simply because they can't type fast enough or spell right. All right, so those are some simple tips. 
on how to design for dyslexia. And I hope today that you have a better understanding of what dyslexia is. It's really just a different way of thinking. All of us think differently here. And I think as we move forward in product design, as it becomes more established in the world, that we'll be able to be able to design better for everyone and not just the few. Thank you very much.